So we've heard a lot about vaccine hesitancy, especially as it relates to COVID-19 vaccine. At Pfizer, we know that every new vaccine is only good for public health if the public trusts that it's safe and utilizes the vaccine. To that end, we've worked hard to be as transparent as possible throughout the process of developing the vaccine. We will continue to do so as we move forward. And while we're moving at the urgent pace due to the serious pandemic, we are not cutting corners. The science and scientists are guiding this process. Welcome to State of Reform's Virtual Leadership Series with some of healthcare's most thoughtful leaders. And now the host of State of Reform, DJ Wilson. Hello and welcome to this uh, live edition of State of Reform's Virtual Leadership Series. My name is DJ Wilson, one of the hosts here at State of Reform bringing you this event. And um, I say live because, you know, when you do this stuff live and interactive where you can participate with us uh, amongst the attendees here, the 180 or so folks I see in the room right now, uh, you never know what could happen. Uh, and so we are really excited and honored that Senator Fields and Senator uh, Smallwood and uh, Amanda and Caitlin are here with us in the middle of or kind of the front end or the during the legislative session. It's sort of a awkward uh, or different kind of calendar this year in uh, this period of COVID, but I really appreciate that they carved out time to be with us. We're still waiting for Senator Fields to join us. I know she's uh, in the metaphorical room and she's gonna be here in a second. Uh, and when she joins, we have to do all kinds of uh, jury rigging and kind of figuring things out with bailing wire and duct tape on the back end here. Uh, and so I, I wanna bring up for introduction some of our attendees now and let them, uh, let them shine and introduce themselves, then we'll jump into Senator Fields as she comes in. So first, the, uh, the caucus chair or the Senate Minority Caucus, Senator Smallwood, thank you, sir, for making time to be with us. Great, yeah, DJ, thanks for having me. Good to be on with uh, you and your crew. Uh, yeah. I'm the uh, ranking member of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee here in the state of Colorado, representing uh, Douglas County. And Amanda Massey, the executive director of the Colorado Association of Health Plans. Amanda, thanks for making time to be with us. Thank you for having me, DJ. Very excited to be here tonight and talking about legislative policy this year um, and how uh, how things are going to proceed now that we're actually back in session. Now that we're back, that's right. And uh, Caitlin Lucar Lucarello, I always kind of mess up your name, but uh, uh, Director of State Policy at Pharma. Thank you, Caitlin, for making time to be with us as well. Thanks so much, DJ, for bringing all of these uh, really fantastic views together at a really important time right now. I'm looking forward to it. So Senator Smallwood, let me ask you to start us off and, and sir, let me tell you also, I appreciate your uh, uh, technological savvy. We couldn't get your link to work on your desktop and so you're using your the magic of your iPhone, which I appreciate. Uh, give us a rundown first of just how the logistics are working or will be working during this legislative session. Uh, tell us you know, what it's like to be a legislator trying to make policy in this kind of COVID environment. Yeah, and I guess I should say, first of all, since I am using my phone, are you able to hear me okay? Yep, sounds great. Uh, perfect, <laughs> yeah. So um, logistically speaking, it's not bad. I think people have gotten more comfortable um, dealing with the pandemic over the course of the last year. So in the in the chamber itself, there's uh, things like partitions, there's masking, there's social distancing. So I think we're doing the best we can um, from that perspective, and it seems to be going well. I would say one um, enormous frustration is definitely still there. It's what I was um, really most concerned about when they proposed doing this last year, which is the ability to um, really work with your colleagues one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the hallway conversations, the lobby conversations, particularly, you know, when my colleagues have a bill that, that let's say I, I agree with most of it, but I'd like to see um, one adjustment made you know, this used to be something that you walk over to your colleague's desk and say, hey, here's here's your bill, here's the page, here's the line. What do you think about changing uh, shall to may or may to shall or 10 to 20? And and those were easy conversations to have. And and candidly, now we have a, a, a number of legislators who um, are remote most or all of the time. And so those conversations go away. So um, I think that 
better policy was made when everybody was there. Um, candidly, I think we should make a decision one way or the other. Either the place is too dangerous for us to work there and, we, and none of us should be there, or it's not too dangerous for us to be there and we need to make some sort of, um, I guess, concessions so that those conversations can still happen. And sticking with you for a minute, Senator, do you find, has this period of COVID, now that we're sort of in a state of chronic COVID, last year it was kind of scary and early and we had to kind of adjust rapidly, but now we've been able to plan for this period for a little while. Uh, have you seen more bipartisan result in terms of the administration of the chamber uh, and the legislature overall? Uh, or are we still very much in a highly, I mean, obviously we're in a highly polarized time, but has the election sort of lingered uh, a little bit, which, which, which is more the case? You know, I don't, I don't know that I've seen a lot of difference post-election versus pre-election, DJ. Um, I, I would say generally speaking, it's still quite collegial on the the tactical sorts of things you know getting the state's business done sunset hearings and uh, logistical type bills you know those are still done on a bipartisan bicameral basis i believe all the bills that i've ran this year just like last year just like the year before had republican and democratic uh, sponsors so i think by and large that happens what's what's changes uh, from 2 years ago is that you know the majority is still the majority they uh, the democratic party controls the governor's office the house and the senate and so on on big issues um I, I don't see a lot of people bending, right? They they uh, they stick by party lines, and that's um, that's what I saw last year, and it's what I've seen so far this year on the the big policy issues. Amanda, how about from where you sit uh, as an advocate on behalf of your association members? Uh, how what are the logistics like when it comes to advocacy so far this year? I think it's been quite challenging for us as an advocacy organization. I, I recognize it's also very challenging for legislators as well, because as Senator Smallwood said, you know, we're used to being in person, we're used to having those conversations, and I think it does um, end up in better policy for Coloradans when we can all be together in a room and have some of these conversations. Um, I think, you know, when we came back in June last year, there were definitely some serious issues in terms of stakeholder processes when we returned. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, we've sorted some of that out as we start this session in terms of how to make sure that there is engagement um, in a lot of these really big bills that are going to be discussed. Um, we're hoping that there will be more considerable efforts made to include all stakeholders at the table as we discuss some of these policies, um, particularly having time to comment on draft bills, um, particularly having virtual stakeholder meetings where we know everybody who's on the who's on the meeting invite or who's participating and having the opportunity to comment um, when we do have those meetings. Um, and I think also hoping that there'll be equal weight given for testimony. I think when we came back in June last year, you know, you really had to be in person to be heard. Um, and we certainly don't want to put legislators or staff, um, you know, put their safety at risk. So I think we're hopeful that the logistics are getting better this session, but um, obviously it remains to be seen. Yeah, Caitlin, what are your thoughts on this question of being heard as uh, as an organization also with a bunch of members and, and their interests? People can disagree and, you know, they can make decisions in the legislative process uh, for a range of reasons. But in terms of advocates being heard, are you worried about not being able to be heard in this new kind of logistical arrangement? Or do you think maybe this allows for many, many, many more voices into the mix? You know, I, I echo Amanda's concerns about the stakeholder process and uh, testifying um, publicly versus remotely last session. I certainly think we are ironing out some of those issues, but um, also agree with Senator Smallwood that some of these conversations that are really nuanced or more involved um, or maybe something that you could have in passing specifically around healthcare, health policy, or prescription drug um, related bills are a little easier to have face to face when you're in the same room, when we're all at the table together and kind of accountable to each other um, face to face. And so I certainly am concerned um, about you know, not having that process in its normal form going forward. But I certainly do think we are starting to work out some of those little connection issues, uh, process issues, 
typical kind of technical issues that were arising. And so I'm optimistic um, about this session. And I also think just to say that's why having more of these types of conversations um, and forums like this one today, where we're kind of bringing all these different viewpoints together uh, to talk about policy are extremely important right now. We, we have uh, Senator Fields who we're trying to get into the conversation. We'll incorporate her as soon as she's available. Uh, Senator Smallwood, why don't you give us a rundown on what your caucus hopes to achieve in terms of health policy and some of the healthcare conversations that the majority caucus will be driving and how you'll sort of respond to some of those. So, you know, thoughts on your agenda, but also thoughts on how you'll respond to what Democrats are likely to do. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that being in the minority gives the Republicans either in the House or the Senate um, a lot of confidence to be able to push forward uh, agenda items. So sadly, I know this isn't the story that, that people necessarily probably want to hear, but for us, it's playing a lot of defense, really. I mean, we're we're dealing in a world right now where um, the, the election brought forth a lot of the conversations from the um, the farther left, I would say, when it comes to things like um, Medicare for all, and that's um, sort of manifesting itself in Colorado as a kind of a quasi Medicaid for all ty type of discussion. And so I think there's defense that needs to be played on things like that, on things like drug importation, which we've been talking about since Donald Trump was a candidate um, that, that still hasn't materialized as um, kind of the solution for high cost prescription drugs. Um, so, so I'm, I'm certainly working with my caucus to try to bring forth solutions that work now versus just a lot of the rhetoric that we've heard. But a lot of it, DJ, is going to be playing defense against things like single payer, which if you follow Colorado politics, our, our governor, that was a campaign promise to bring forth a, a multi-state single payer system and coordinating efforts against that is, is a heavy lift. So, Caitlin, the I would say the you know the Polis administration has been as supercharged on healthcare reform as any administration uh, of which I'm aware in the country in the last uh, few years. On this uh, on this question of drug importation uh, that Senator Smallwood brings up, what are your concerns? What, what are your what are the attributes of that uh, proposal that you think you can agree with? And if not that, then what would you propose in terms of trying to get a handle on some of the uh, pharmaceutical costs in, in healthcare? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, as Senator Smallwood mentioned in Colorado, um, we're spending a few million dollars getting this Canadian importation program up and running um, with really kind of no proof points or evidence base that there's actually savings there. Um, and then this year, we're expecting to likely see a bill introduced that would expand that program, which hasn't even been implemented yet, um, to uh, to enter to other countries. And essentially, you know, we see that as a largely federal issue because um, the, the federal statute right now does not allow for the importation of drugs from other countries besides Canada or the importation of biologics, which um, the, the administration has also been um, promoting. And so, you know, I think those are, are, are certainly concerns of ours that we would expand a program um, potentially before even having those proof points there. Um, but that, then just in general, we've, you know, certainly continued to express concern. Canada has said that they will likely block the import of any drugs that are in shortage. Um, and so we're certainly concerned that this can create all sorts of access issues and problems for folks that are relying on imported drugs um, as their main source of medicines. Amanda, how about this this topic of uh, uh, of single payer, the aspirations of a single payer uh, uh, vision that might be more aspirational than legislative in this term, but certainly a public option uh, is likely to be in legislative form and on the table. What are your thoughts on where the public option conversation is in Colorado as we continue to sort of wait for a bill to show up? Yeah, I think, you know, that that's a key question. I think it goes back to your first question on logistics is we still don't have a draft bill. So it's really hard to know exactly where the public option conversation is going to go this session. Um, we've heard at a high level kind of the, the concept of this phase one, phase two perspective with phase one being um, a premium, a target premium reduction for the health insurance industry over the next two years. Um, we've heard 
you know, somewhere around 20% over those two years, which, you know, if you look at kind of where Colorado has come since 2019, there was a recent Kaiser Family Foundation study that showed, you know, Colorado has the third least expensive benchmark plan in the nation. Um, and premiums here on, on the average benchmark premium have gone down about 30% since 2019. So the question we really have is, you know, is this proposal feasible? Are we just being set up to fail so that we can bring in a government-run health insurance option? Um, and I think that's a big question that we have in terms of what this proposal would look like. I think we're also really concerned about you know, what is the data and analysis behind this proposal? We haven't seen any um, sort of analysis. So lots of questions outstanding in terms of if there's some sort of premium reduction target, um, are we taking into account legislative bills that are being discussed this session, particularly mandates on coverage that would increase premiums? Are we taking um, account of changes to the benchmark plan that are currently being discussed for 2023? Are we taking account of federal policy changes? I'm sure many people are aware of the American Rescue Plan, Medicare X, which was just introduced at the federal level. How will all of these policies play into whatever proposal is going to be on the table this year? I don't think that there's been a robust discussion around those issues. So um, just really waiting to see what is going to be in this draft bill. Um I want to say thank you to Pfizer. They're one of our sponsors who have helped make this conference or this uh, conversation uh, free for folks to attend. I appreciate uh, them putting wind in our sails, and certainly it's a good story to hear when they talk about their uh, talk about the work that they're doing on innovation and uh, uh, on the vaccines. So, uh, Senator Fields, I we see you there, and I want to try and bring you up on screen. I appreciate you making time, ma'am. Uh, let me ask you, ma'am. Um, it's been you know. One step forward with this legislative session, one step back. We're taking another step forward this week. Uh, give us a rundown of of what you would like to see happen in terms of the Senate Democratic agenda for health policy in this legislative session. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And I want you all to know that I was listening to the conversation, but you guys couldn't hear me. I, I heard all of the introductions. I heard my colleague, the uh, ranking member of the Health and Human Services, um, share his comments. And I think for me, uh, the priority is similar. And it's like, I want to see us um, boost our economy. I want to see us fight the virus. And I want to see our kids back in school and address some of the learning loss that has been caused by um, COVID-19. And so I think that's going to be the primary focus of, of our session. Uh, the governor gave a state of the state address and he outlined special um legislation that he would uh, like to see move forward that will help our uh, most vulnerable people as it relates to the loss of income, maybe loss of jobs, addressing housing. Um, a bill that I'm going to be working on this session is a bill to create a statewide health equity plan. And so I agree with some of the comments that have been made in reference to uh, the stakeholder um, connection and, and conversations because we're still having them, but they're just in a different format. You know, Senator Fields, uh, how I, I think this equity issue, uh, it has always been there, but it has it has risen and been elevated uh, in this moment of COVID. Do you find that there's a new willingness among some of your colleagues to embrace questions of health equity and is now a time to really, uh, you know, really stretch to try to uh, address some of those issues? I hope so, because when you look at who's getting the vaccine, as it relates to the black and brown folks, we're not getting the vaccination soon enough or fast enough. And so it could be historical in reference to pa past practices, or it could be that, like me, they have issues with technology because you do have to enroll. And if you're 70 or 65, you might have some issues navigating it. And sometimes some of these facilities, like UC Health, for example, you know, um, they're intimidating. And so we need to be doing more outreach kind of um, efforts in some of our churches and some of our trusted um, community health centers and uh, other locations where it's easy access. You know, well, maybe you don't have to have a transportation or ride a bus to get there. But I think there is um, a greater um, understanding of how the COVID has had a severe impact on our black and brown people. And I think it's because we were essential workers and um, we're stocking the stores. We may be driving the bus. Um, our, our kids are home, you know, with very little 
supervision, why the mom and dad might be out working. So I think there is an understanding that we need to address chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes and those kinds of things. Um, so I, I think there are, but we'll see what happens with the bill. It's going to start in the Senate and then it'll go over to the House and hopefully the governor will sign it. Yeah, great. Well, keep us posted. I'd love to help tell that story at State of Reform. That's uh, good stuff. We have talked already about uh, the public option uh, idea in terms of legislation and, and uh, drug importation costs. Do you want to just take a minute to offer your thoughts on those two topics of, of what a public option uh, bill might look like in your committee and then what, uh, what, where we stand in terms of uh, drug importation? That was another topic that the governor mentioned in his state of the state address. So we are going to have a, a um, public option bill. I have not seen the bill yet, but the last bill um, really addressed public options as it relates to people in our rural areas. And so it really focused on providing greater um, affordable prices for them. But then the people, I represent Senate District um, 29, the people who are working already have uh, insurance. And they saw their premiums somewhat increase a little bit. So I just want to make sure that whatever we do doesn't have a ripple effect to some of our people who already like and, and have insurance and they're not having to pay more for it. You know, Senator Smallwood, we, well, one of the topics that is has been baked into the public option conversation, at least in in uh, the previous session, was this uh, question about hospital pricing. And uh, there's a lot of variation according to HICPUF data between the, uh, the rural and the urban hospital setting, particularly not just in pricing, but in, in profit. Um, how do you think this COVID experience has changed the politics around hospitals and pricing? Uh, has COVID, has this experience changed the way we think about the importance of hospitals uh, across both settings? Or what are your thoughts there? Uh, I mean, I think it's a pretty prophetic question because um, you one would have thought that that would be the case, right? We were um, in in one sentence praising our healthcare workers and our facilities for you know doing the right thing. I mean, these people got into the trenches and they came to work and they they took care of people, right? Um, so in, in in one breath, we tell the the, the community that these folks are heroes. And then we turn around a few months later and uh, sort of, in my opinion, villainize them a little bit saying, you know, they make too much money. The facilities that they work in make too much money. The physicians make too much money. We have to do something to, you know, tamp down exactly what they're able to charge. So it's a, I think it's a confusing message for people that don't live health policy every day. It's like, are these folks heroes or are they villains? Um, granted, we all want healthcare costs to be affordable and we all want to have um, everybody with access to coverage and access to care, but simply targeting providers and facilities the way that we have, um, I, don't, I don't know that that sends the right message. So a long-winded way of saying, I don't know, I don't know what the, the vibe is out there anymore because you're hearing two different messages. So Amanda, if we had had this conversation in any state in the country four or five years ago, and we had a couple of legislators and, and we had uh, uh, an association of health plans executive director. Uh, I feel confident that uh, drug pricing and hospital pricing uh, would have been topics uh, in that conversation four or five years ago. Do you think from the plan view that, that this pandemic has changed the politics around uh, pharmaceutical companies and hospitals because they have played such a central role both in keeping us uh, alive in many cases and vaccinating us moving forward? You know, I, I think to some extent, uh, perhaps, I mean, I think I certainly want to give credit to our provider partners and, and um, you know, the, the drug manufacturers that did provide this vaccine. And we certainly value them. And I think we've worked really hard with them this last year together as private industry to really adapt quickly and be flexible and meet the needs of Coloradans. I mean, I think about, you know, how we were able to deliver telehealth in an unprecedented time together because there was flexibility provided from the state in terms of how we were able to do that that. Um, so I think it has changed the conversation a bit, but I think ultimately, and, and this has really been our message for a long time, 
premiums are based on the prices of drugs and um, healthcare services, which are provided by hospitals and um, providers. And in order to re- in order to reduce the cost of premiums, we have to reduce those prices. So I think what you have seen in Colorado is we have found some innovative ways to do that. For example, the reinsurance program, and we've seen some. Um, some of the prices of premiums come down, but ultimately those still are the key pieces to try and make um, health insurance more affordable. And I think, you know, we are certainly open to um, ideas that are workable, that will bring down the cost of drugs, um, that will bring down the costs um, of uh, services from providers as well. And I think that's why you've seen us support things like the out of network bill, which we really did feel like would also help consumers and bring down premiums. So we're always open to looking for, for solutions that are workable in that area. I'm just not convinced that this public option bill is one of them. So Caitlin, where's, where are some of those areas of alignment right now, maybe that are unique to this period in COVID, where health plans and hospitals and physicians and pharma, uh, where they can agree and build consensus on things that will lower costs and which the legislature can then implement? Where, where do you think the low-hanging fruit is, if anywhere? Yeah, um, it's a really great question. And I'll just say that I think you're hearing it as we're talking um, amongst us right now that really there is this desire for collaboration um, and this desire to continue to ensure as industry in Colorado that our health system works better for patients. Um, I think COVID-19 just highlighted how important uh, those issues continue to be. Um, And it's just great to be having these conversations about how to make healthcare and prescription drugs more affordable for patients. Um, One of the things that we see is really promising um, and could significantly benefit patients is passing through rebates um, to patients at the point of sale. Manufacturers pay substantial rebates to insurers and PBMs every year. And while patients benefit from negotiations with hospital costs and physician costs, they're not always benefiting from those rebate negotiations. Um, And so we really would like to see patients benefit from those rebates at the point of sale. Um, I think that's something that we uh, we can kind of agree on that all pa- that we want to make drugs more affordable for patients as it relates to that conversation, which is called is the policy is called rebate pass through. Um, I think there's some trade offs there, right? Pharma would really, really like to see patients um, benefit and get lower drug prices at the point of sale. Uh, some other folks might like to see those uh, rebates spread out amongst everyone to lower premiums. And so I think those are conversations that we can and continue to have, but great ones to have because we're really talking about how to make prices more affordable for patients when it comes to their medicines. Good. I see a couple of questions. There's one from uh, Andrew Rose that I'll ask. Uh, He says, Colorado has incorporated uh, MHPAEA parity, mental health parity, into state law. Uh, Should this law have a private right of action? Um, Amanda, do you are you familiar with this private right of action uh, framework in the mental health parity legislation or uh, approach? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, I think that he's referring to MAPIA, which is a federal law around mental health parity. Um, and here in Colorado, we worked with uh, Mental Health Colorado and the advocates in 2019 um, and passed um, HB 191269, which is around mental health parity. So we have been implementing that for the last year. Um, and we know that the Division of Insurance will uh, put out a report on kind of where everything stands with that implementation. But health plans have been working diligently to, impl- to implement this policy. I mean, uh, um, mental health parity is very complex. It's about ensuring that you know benefits are comparable across um, medical, surgical, and behavioral health, um, and that's something that we continue to to work towards. Um, we haven't had a conversation about private right of action, but I would assume that that's not something we would support uh, from a parity perspective. We're certainly working with the division um, and with others to really make sure that this Im- is implemented. We want our members to be getting the care that they need, regardless of whether that's on the behavioral health side or the mental health side. So, Senator Fields, how do you think about mental health and essentially coming to the aid of Coloradans who have endured trauma during this last 11-month period, collectively and individually, and their their mental health acuity, their problems are increasing? Uh, how, as a policymaker, can do you think about pol- putting policy into place that can support Coloradans' mental health? It's not always an easy answer. What are your thoughts? 
You know, it's like, I think that mental health is just as important as physical health. And they kind of all come together. And Amanda, I can't believe you remember that bill number. (laughs) (laughs) I got so many bill numbers floating in my head. But I remember um, being a a champion for that bill. And if you remember the Affordable Health Care Act under Obama's administration, he was the, um, his administration made it possible for health care to be on some level of parity, not health care, but um, behavioral health, so that you could get um, insurance paying for your behavioral health. So I think in the state of Colorado, we've been doing um, a lot of great work. Once again, in the um, the state of the state address from the governor's office, I'm going to be sponsoring a bill to streamline and kind of get rid of some of the silos. Sometimes it's very hard to navigate behavioral health services in the state because there's so many people doing so many different things. There may be 10 organizations doing uh, uh, suicide prevention or you know all those kinds of things. So we're gonna to try to pull all that together so there'll be one, no wrong door when somebody's coming through um, to one of our having a, a crisis, behavioral health. We're going to, that they need through one door instead of being redirected four or five different times. And that's going to be called the behavioral, uh, be- Colorado behavior. We lost your audio there, Senator. The co- I heard Colorado Behavioral Health. It was just a connection yes. issue. Your phone's fine. Colorado, what was the name of it? A Colorado Behavioral Health Task Force. Awesome. Great. So the first part of the bill is just to look at all the different um, organizations that are addressing behavioral health and try to streamline that. I want to reiterate for folks who are in our metaphorical room here that you can post questions in the uh, in the chat box there. I see Andrew's got a bunch of them. Uh, I'll let folks sort of upvote those and, and let us know which ones are uh, of highest priority. Senator Smallwood, let me ask you kind of this like insider question um, that I think is always interesting to me personally, which is you get you get legislators who show up often in the House, but sometimes in the Senate in their first term with a lot of ideas about health policy. And those manifest in a lot of ways in the caucus room and in caucus meetings. Uh, but where you sit both as caucus chair, you've got to kind of manage some of that verve and energy. Uh, but then also as ranking member, you know, on the on the Health and Human Services Committee, you, you see the just complexity and the difficulty of of the sausage making of health policy. How do you kind of bring your new members along to what is possible in health policy? How do you kind of, you know, letting them sort of speak to their concerns and their issues and represent their district, of course, but um, how do you bring them along to what is doable in legislative politics? Well, if I could answer that question, I probably wouldn't be in the Colorado State Senate. I'd be uh, more on a larger stage. Uh, but but, uh, but it's, it's a fair question, DJ. And I would say that um, everybody comes at this with a slightly different perspective. Um, they're representing districts from all across the state. And, um, you know, particularly for our, our mountain communities, our frontier communities, uh, the agricultural communities. You know, they've, they've got a very different look at this than somebody who's, uh, let's say, a metro legislator uh, like like most of my district and a lot of Senator Fields districts. Right. They you know, we, we're blessed with a lot of choice, for example, a lot of hospitals close by, a lot of physicians close by. We don't have the, the travel distances. Um, Senator Fields mentioned you know, public transportation as a need. So, so everybody comes at this with a slightly different angle. And um, I would say that. Um, Generally speaking, everybody kind of wants the same thing. They want um, affordability and access. It's just different ways of going about that. And sometimes it's as simple as uh, talking to these legislators to say, look, what you're what you're trying to do is noble, but this is the way that actuarially this all pans out. And, you know, it's it doesn't you know, I don't think that's going to work, you know, but, uh, you know, in the Colorado Senate, there aren't any caucus positions. I, I can I can you know, counsel people and lend an ear, but there's no such thing as as me or the majority, minority leader coming in and telling folks, you know, you can't run a bill to do this, or you shouldn't run a bill to do this, or you should vote this way or that way. That that just doesn't happen in the in the Senate, certainly not on the Republican side. My guess is it doesn't happen on the Democratic side either. Um, so um, my guess is there's, uh, 
you'd find it very boring that there's not as many of these conversations going on as one might think. <laughs> how would you, Senator, how would you rate the uh, uh, or reflect or comment on or provide insight on the working relationship between HICPUF, uh, the Department of Insurance, and other advocates for the Pulse Administration on health reform. How do you find that working relationship to be? Uh, it's across the aisle, but not a legislative aisle. Uh, what, do, what are some insights there? Yeah, I think I think each department and agency is really focused on their own work. And I would like to see more collaboration and um, integration of the work because they're really good at doing their own business. But you know, their business might impact what's going on in HIF pub or public health. And everyone's driven by their own goals, with whatever has been established, their own mission. And I would like to see much more collaboration. I can tell you, um, when you were asking the question of Senator Smallwood about how he coaches and uh, mentors uh, colleagues, I can tell you he mentors and coaches all of us. <laughs> so That's pretty pretty high mark, and, Senator Smallwood. That's good. I pray. I pray. And the way he does it, he's really very uh, creative at it because what he'll do, does, he's, he's really good at this. He dives deep into the actual language of the bill and making sure we all understand clearly what we're voting on. And then if the bill sponsor is not able to explain um, their own bill, that's when you get a sense of the bill might need more work. And so he's really good at, you know, making sure that we all understand the work that's in front of us and if it's going to be good policy or not. Sometimes it passes, sometimes it fails, or maybe we might lay it over and bring it back. So I just want to add that piece. He's really good at that. That's high, high praise indeed. Those, those are uh, great marks. Uh, let me ask you, Amanda, I want to give everybody a chance to tackle this, this last question as we near the end of our time together. Um, you know, uh, it's been a heck of a year. Uh, it's been a heck of the last three or four months. It's been a heck of the last three or four weeks. Um, what gives you hope, Amanda, first? What gives you hope about uh, things as you look out on 2021, as you look out on this legislative session and, and health care reform in general? What what gives you hope either personally or professionally? You know, I think that just the resiliency that we've seen of colleagues, of family, of the legislature. I mean, I think what we've really seen is an adaptability and a flexibility that I don't think we knew we had. Um, and particularly in those moments that that were really difficult. I'm sure everyone's been through them this year. Um, and I, I really am, I think in terms of healthcare policy, as I said before, I think what you've seen is the private industry really being able to step up um, and do what needs to be done during the pandemic. And I think, you know, if given the opportunity, we continue to do that. Yeah. Caitlin, how about from where you sit, what gives you hope as you look out onto 2021? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think what, what the pandemic last year, what 2020 really showed us was just the power of public and private industry collaboration, um, interests coming together to find uh, solution treatments, vaccines for COVID faster, um, and just kind of the importance of that previous investment that we made in R&D on finding kind of the future treatments and cures, our current treatments and cures for COVID-19. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons we were able to get a vaccine to market so quickly was certainly those investments in technology, um, you know, and then very recent research on very similar diseases like SARS and MERS. Um, and being able to build on those investments really helped us bring that vaccine to market in record time. So I think it just um, one of the lessons learned is really the importance of collaboration and working together to find solutions that work in our market that are market based and continue to protect the kind of amazing innovation that got us um, to where we are today so quickly. Great stuff. Senator Smallwood, what gives you hope as you look out on to 2021? Um, I, I probably have a little bit more pessimistic view. I really do in this in the state of Colorado. And and the, the reason being is, as, as you can probably tell from the tone, you know, Senator Fields and I, I think, have an have an excellent relationship. We work really, really well together and we have 
we have honest and, and frank conversations with each other, even when we disagree. And I would say the same with um, some of my other colleagues, Senator Janal out of Fort Collins, uh, another Democrat on the health committee that we work really well with. But um, I'll probably get in trouble from both of these colleagues by saying this, but I, I think their voices are slowly but surely getting drowned out by the, the more radical voices in the healthcare world. Those that if, if it's not Medicare or Medicaid for all, then it's not good enough, right? Um, and which which petrifies somebody like me because um, I think consumer choice. You know, having grown up in Germany, having had had family members um, live and die in a in a, a, a nationalized or socialized healthcare system, um, I see the value in choice. And I'm very, very worried that, um, you know, when Senator Fields is term limited out, which isn't that long from now, when Senator Janal is no longer there and they're they're replaced with my fear is somebody from a farther and farther uh, left perspective. Um, I think those relationships are going to be gone. I think a lot of that institutional knowledge is going to be gone. And and I'm very, very nervous about the future of our state from a from a health care perspective because of that. And it has nothing to do with most of my colleagues that are that are currently in office, I just I just see the route things are going and and it it, uh, it makes me real nervous. Senator Fields, what gives you hope as you look out on to 2021? Well, see, if you don't have hope, then you have fear. And so um, I'm very hopeful as I look at um, what our state and our governor and um, everyone that has come together to make sure that we get shots into people's arms. Um, I really think that our website that we have on uh, as it relates to COVID and the resources, I see a lot of partnership with the Tri-County Health Organizations, with our schools, making sure that, you know, we have blended learning. They're doing the best they can. They had to navigate this virus with very little direction from the federal government or from the state. But teachers and administrators and build, building leaders, they figured it out. And um, so I'm very hopeful. You know, it's my hope that by fall that our, our kids will be back in school if the parent uh, wants that to happen for that for them. I'm hoping that with the number of people that are getting vaccinated every day, that we'll get back to some sense of normality, whatever that looks like moving forward. Um, so I'm very hopeful. And what I've seen is that the community has been very resilient. Wherever I go somewhere, the majority of people are wearing masks. And people are complying with being socially distant. And so, you know, you know, I'm not watching who's washing their hands, but I'm quite sure they're doing that as well. I think everyone's trying to do their part to make sure that we're keeping our community uh, safe. So I'm very, very hopeful that um, we're going to get through this and, um, and we're going to get through this together. Senator Rhonda Fields, the chair of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee. Senator Jim Smallwood, the minority caucus chair and vice, or excuse me, uh, ranking member on Senate Health and Human Services. Amanda Massey, executive director of the Colorado Association of Health Plans and Caitlin Lucarello, state policy director at Pharma. Thank you guys for, for being part of this, for rolling with us uh, in the technology challenges that we sometimes have. Uh, to the folks on this uh, webinar, I appreciate you being with us in this virtual conversation. We'll post this at our site, so it will live on and you can come back and watch it then. Thanks for being with us and we'll continue covering Colorado healthcare at statereform.com. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks for joining us in this virtual conversation and for your support of our work at State of Reform.